What's up, Dob fam? Coach Derek here, and I want to go over all things Double Everest. I did a Q&A on my Instagram, and you guys sent me some awesome questions, so let's dive into it. So I should probably preface what we're talking about. It's the Double Everest, which is me climbing 58,064 feet in one ride. I did it on one segment, up and down. It took 27 hours. It was absolutely brutal. The hardest thing I've ever done, and uh, we captured it all. So if you haven't watched that yet, I'd recommend checking that out before you see this, or maybe this will pique your interest. We'll see. But that's what we're talking about, uh, so some of these questions make sense. What were those hot meals you were eating? Those meals were totally unexpected. I didn't actually bring them myself, and they were Mountain House dehydrated meals. Kind of like an MRE, I probably taste a little bit better, but my dad had brought those, and they sort of replaced the chicken noodle soup that I brought because I knew I wanted or I would probably want some type of broth, something warm at night because I rode through the night. And those were totally unexpected. They hit the spot. We had a jet boil and I was eating like beef stroganoff and chicken and rice and uh, lasagna. And it was just hot and it was absolutely the best thing I ate for the entire ride. And so uh, they were mountain house meals. Uh, no sponsor plug there, but they were great. And honestly, if I ever do another, I mean, I, I'm sure I will do another 24 hour or more event, I'll definitely bring something like that because the hardiness in my stomach was perfect. The macros were actually great and they're high in sodium. So highly recommend any cramps, how to prevent or get rid of cramps. This one's interesting. There are a lot of things to consider with cramping. Um, for this ride, I didn't get any cramps. However, there was one point that I felt like they could come on because my muscles felt like they got really tight. And that was around 45,000 feet of climbing. I did my turnaround at the bottom and the first little roller was super steep on this climb. So I would basically stand at each lap. And it was nice after being in the saddle on the scent. So I'd stand by my gear. And I remember one where all of a sudden my legs just felt sore. And they were feeling obviously super fatigued at that point, but they felt sore already. And in my head, I thought, oh man, I wonder if this is going to lead to a cramp. And also what's going to happen with my body next. This was when I felt like my body started kind of shutting down. Uh, this was the point where I couldn't really get my heart rate above 140 anymore. And so, yeah, I, I didn't get a cramp, but that was the closest I got. Uh, so at the top, when I got there, someone had brought me a hot shot, which is this crazy, like high-end pepper tasting little shot you take that people swear by. Uh, I took it and it was like not easy to drink at the time, but at the same time, I think it might've worked because I never ended up getting a cramp. Uh, but I also had a big balance of, I mean, electrolytes, uh, BPN electrolytes have 500 milligrams per scoop. My G1M Sport Mix has 350 milligrams per scoop along with carbohydrate. Uh, I was drinking mustard literally out of the bottle. Uh, and there's a lot of things you want to do with hydration, electrolytes, uh, and then even things like vinegar and apparently like cayenne pepper that <laughs> you can check out. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is staying on top of hydration and electrolytes and also making sure that you don't have any major compensations in your body. And I can't prove this for you uh, with any study, but I'm convinced that uh, regular foam rolling, stretching, making sure that you don't have these compensations throughout your body helps prevent cramps because it prevents overuse of specific muscle groups. And uh, I don't know, can't prove it yet, but we probably will in the future because I, I'm guaranteed, I, I know that ha that has to help. Where and how often did you pee? So I peed just on the side of the road. Uh, am I allowed to say that? We had a really good little turnout and it was easy to kind of step to the side and take a leak. Uh, in the beginning, I peed every couple of hours and I got to a point where I maybe went, I don't know, it was uh, like six hours or eight hours without peeing. Like the last third of the ride or quarter, I don't think I peed. Uh, so that that's just at the point where your body, I think, is soaking up everything and you know it. Recovery after such a hard effort, sleep, insomnia, the recovery was insane. Uh, I'm really happy with how on top of all the modalities I was, you know, I was eating as much as I could, drinking a ton. I had compression boots. I had massage guns and foam rolling and stretching. And uh, I used all of my knowledge on that front, like right away. I mean, I was there gunning as on the ride home from this thing. And so what I was really, really adamant about was making sure I did a spin the following day. We actually had a travel day. So the following day, I got a good night's sleep, no trouble sleeping that night. You know, I was up for 48 hours and I did that effort. So 
it's like when my bed hit the when my bed hit the pillow when my head hit the pillow i slept great i got eight hours of sleep and then woke up i think that next morning we walked around because i just i i could tell i wanted to move my body and so we went to i think walked to like a starbucks and i got those sausage breakfast sandwiches and i ended up getting two of them because they gave me some other guys on accident and i was like no problem i ate that thing too (laughs) and so and i would never i would never have like a 900 calorie breakfast or whatever and it was just so easy to get down i'd like stop myself from eating more uh because i didn't want to get sick too so anyways we drive home it's like a six and a half hour drive I'm start. I looked at myself in the rearview mirror and I'm like looking gaunt, like skinny. So I start eating all the snacks from the rides, Oreos, Rice Krispie treats, and I'm just shoveling it down. Uh, and then on the ride home, I just st- could feel my legs swelling up. And so the thing I was adamant about was making sure I did a spin the next day on my bike. And I just wanted to get out and like get some fresh air when I got home. So I ended up doing like a 15 minute mountain bike. Uh, ride around my neighborhood so i live in the suburbs so i just got on my mountain bike to be on a different type of bike uh you know different grips because my hands were so bruised and swollen so i just did an easy spin i think i titled the ride when 100 watts feels like 400 watts because it was just like my body was moving through quicksand but moving it made me feel so much better because i think it just got the blood flow going and again you didn't have the pooling in your legs which i've noticed on big rides like this and so I would recommend anyone doing a monster effort to do a little bit of something the next day to move their body uh, on top of some stretching. And I know for me, a hot shower, any hot water, um, you know, people can tell me, oh, it's going to increase inflammation or whatever. But dude, it just makes your body, it allows you to move. And so it just feels very relaxing. And so anyways, I was very adamant about that spin. And then I stuck to my normal training frequency and had insanely low uh intensity the next week and no insomnia really thankfully but my mood was all over the place for the first week my appetite was all over the place for the first week just my energy in general uh, my hunger and it wasn't till like the second week that that stabilized uh, but i was still fatigued and then the third week i started bringing back some intensity and it was like the end of the third week i started hitting some actual power uh, prs like for normalized power for like a 40 mile ride and stuff so i started bringing that back up i could tell there's some fitness gain uh but it took close to a month and it has taken that long on some of the past efforts i've done as well so i think that's kind of what you can expect it's a roller coaster for a week out you stabilize but your energy is still low and then you start hopefully if you keep your frequency up and you don't just turn into a blob after you'll probably see some fitness gains like three weeks to a month out Favorite snack for quick energy. On this ride in particular, for quick energy, I did this a lot overnight, but it was Oreos and cold brew coffee. That combination was incredible. I had cold brew in my bottle. I would grab a stack of Oreos, shove them all in my mouth, wash down the cold brew. Delicious. How much time did you spend training for it? Any dedicated training plan? So I knew coming into this that I couldn't really up my volume as much as I probably should for it, to be honest. And I just relied on some big rides I had in the bank over the previous year. And also just my consistency. Uh, you know, I don't miss workouts. I ride four days a week without fail. And I also strength train twice a week. I have one dedicated rest day. And that's like my normal schedule, just around the clock. And that's what it's been for the last couple of years. And with the exception of like some illness and like minor surgeries and stuff like that, I haven't taken more than a handful of days off. So. Uh, I knew that that consistency would serve me on the on the longer days and just having more of a durable body from all the strength training. Like durability, I think, is one of the most important things to train for, especially for these big efforts. You think you almost are doing it for like some max power. And I think people have that assumption, but it helps you just be more durable uh, because, you know, I mentioned it like less compensation and your body can just uh, be more efficient. And so I think that had helped and I relied on it. But Leading up, I just wanted to try and do a couple big days. And my goal was to do a 12 hour day a month out. Uh, but I ended up doing like two six to eight hour days. And they were spaced one month out and then like two weeks out. And to give you perspective, though, over the previous year, I had done a 200 plus mile ride in the mountains. It was like 15K of climbing. I had already ever sit on my road bike. About a year ago before this, I ever sit on my mountain bike, which was a 20 hour elapsed time deal i had uh bwr which is 130 miles i had multiple rides around 150 miles and like 15,000 feet um 
and one mountain bike ride that was a hundred miles and like 14 K. So I had these like big rides stacked up over the last year. And I knew because I was consistent with my day-to-day schedule, like those were still going to serve me at this point. It was like, there was still hay in the barn from that. Uh, cause I never took any major time off. So, uh, yeah, I just kind of relied on that. How does the Athos compare to the tarmac? It's comparable, uh, because they're both really quality road bikes, uh, but they are very different. And I think the Athos is this perfect fit for someone who just wants a little bit more of a comfortable ride, but at the same time, you know, it climbs so fast. Like I can't even say, oh, if you don't care about KOMs or you don't want to like sprint the fastest on your group ride or whatever, like my local group ride, the real race section of it is at the top of the main climb. And it's like the Athos would be better for my than my tarmac for that. But for all the rolling terrain, flat sprints, I think just the handling in general, I prefer the tarmac. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really tough because both bikes are incredible. And I think it comes down to uh if, if you want more comfort or a little bit more performance i think that's like the one decisive factor uh, but again it's like the more comfort bike is the lighter bike too so you have to consider that it's actually it's hard to kind of pick um but i think when you i got back on my tarmac i was like okay i think this just feels better on the rolling terrain that i ride around here uh, it just felt like the overall handling was a little bit sharper um, and also the aesthetic of internal cable routing for me, like when I ride and I look down and it's just this beautiful, clean cockpit that honestly is something I consider and like the looks too. Um, so I think all of that combined, I prefer my tarmac. Um, but I know for a fact, this Athos was the perfect bike for this project. And it, truthfully, if I really wanted to like just focus on climbing or something, I would absolutely get that Athos. Or if I wanted to just like I don't know, have the most comfortable ride possible. I'd put some like 30C tires on the Athos uh, and roll that thing. And it would still be super fast. So yeah, if you can try both, try both. Bathroom breaks. Uh, and I got like a funny like emoji like that. So I think they want to know if I pooped or not. I had a lot of questions about this. This was the wildest thing. So I rode through the night. Uh, so I handled my business that morning of. We didn't start the ride till like 9.30. Uh, maybe twice I even handled it. I was I was cleaned out, ready to go. And then literally I ride through the night, even through the point where I left my alarm on my phone. And I remember at 5 a.m. it started ringing while I was riding in the night. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is my wake up alarm. And then what's crazy is I'd say my typical schedule, maybe 6.30 or so, I'm hitting the bathroom. And I kid you not, like clockwork, even after riding through the night, 6.30, we made it happen. It, it was crazy. I was like blown away. Um, and yeah, I was able to, uh, figure out how to do that and handle it. So it was good. It might be silly, uh, to ask, but can you start with the basics? Loving the content. Thank you, dude. Uh, when you are on a ride or a ride this big, you really have to understand that the goal is to eat as much as you can and you just try and get as, the goal is to eat as much as you can and not get sick. <laughs> and you're not going to be able to probably keep up with your output most likely for that duration of time. You know, if it was a four hour ride, six hour ride, you could eat a hundred grams of carbs per hour or more, uh, which seems like a lot of people are able to handle it and they're getting smarter about that. Um, typically on rides, I aim for like 75 ish. And I know the more I can get in the beginning of the ride, the more it'll serve me throughout. So I always start a ride with electrolyte with an electrolyte carb mix and I'll have at least 40 grams of carbs in my first bottle. And I make sure I drink that by the first hour and at that first hour mark, I'll hit like a gel uh, or get more uh, liquid carbs somehow, whether it's like a gas station or if I bring some with me or whatever, but that's kind of my rule of thumb of how I start. And so for this ride, I knew anytime I'm drinking, I should probably have some carb mix in it. Uh, with uh, unless I have a couple gels with me and I know I want water because there are times where you're going to just crave the water and a gel can kind of like supplement that carb mix. So I would just say, try and get as much liquid carbohydrate down as possible. Make sure there's electrolytes in there. And uh, that's a really great place to start, um, especially starting rides like that. And then throughout a big day like this, you're going to need big solid food, but the more calories you can drink, the better off you'll be. You just have to really pay attention to your gut distress and it does take a little bit of training. So, you know, you're going to have to 
think about it more when you go on shorter rides, normal rides, you know, start paying attention to what you eat, start pay paying attention to how many grams of carbs you're taking in and set some goals. And that way you'll start to understand what you can handle, what you can't. And then you understand too, what foods work better. Like as you up the calories in general, it's going to be more stress on your gut. And I've had to get a little bit more picky, um, over time. And like, I, I know I can't do chocolate, uh, I'm trying to think of what else I avoid now. I'm starting to avoid certain candies because like even like Sour Patch, as much as I love it, they just don't sit as well in my stomach anymore. Uh, and doing something like dried fruit helps a lot. But but don't get me wrong. I also will get Pringles and a Coca-Cola. And that is like a money snack for me right now. So you have to pay attention to it, get intentional, and you can take that in your big ride. Are you going to keep doing gnarly soul-crushing rides every year? I wonder if it's not good for your body. I'll just tell you, it's definitely not good for your body. I had a comment on my video. They're like, dialed health? Well, this isn't very healthy. And I'm like, yeah, no duh. I know it's not healthy. It, this is like sport. This is this is beyond health. I mean, I, I would argue that even riding 100 miles for most people is not healthy. If we wanted to be perfectly healthy and that's all we cared about, we'd live in these little bubbles and not go ride our bikes, period, because it's too dangerous and it wouldn't be healthy to go break your arm or whatever. So you got to, there's a point where it's like, okay, are you doing it? What, what's the real reason? And, you know, I'm not doing it for health because if that was the case, I'd spend for 30 minutes on like Peloton or something indoors. And that would probably be quote unquote healthier than, you know, riding a hundred miles outdoors. But it's like, what fulfills you? What makes you happy? Like there's all those things to consider. It's not just about health. And uh, especially with the, the food that comes along with it, it's crazy. <laughs> so no, it's not healthy, uh, but there's other reasons to do it. And am I going to keep doing these type of rides? I don't, I honestly don't know. I'll tell you right now, the thought of anything ever sting doesn't sound fun. It just does not sound appealing. Um, you know, I've done basically three in the, within the last year, uh, two this year, uh, literally. And so the thought of doing a big ride does sound intriguing, but I feel like I need to cover some ground. I need to do like a crazy loop. I need to do like a multi-day event or, or just a huge point to point or something like that. Uh, that sounds more appealing. And it's funny because it's only been like two months out and I'm already kind of thinking about, okay, if I was going to do one gnarly thing next year, what would it be? I'm not really sure. But if I really had to compare and say, okay, am I going to do something harder than what I did? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's just going to be different. And I have to add too, I want to be very careful to not get in this game of constantly just trying to one up because there is a point where it's, it's like I, the word sustainable coming back. Like, it's just, it's not really sustainable. Like, I don't know if I'll ever climb more than that specifically, uh, but maybe I'll do a multi-day thing. So anyways, I don't know. It's probably going to be different, not going to be harder. I'm not going to just sit here and try and constantly one-up stuff like that because uh, you just, I don't even know where that goes. I don't want to find out. <laughs> Was the leg pain continually worsening or did it at some point plateau and stay there? It plateaued and stayed there. And I was pretty confident that that's what would happen uh, I'd say with the exception of like 45 K in is when I really felt that leg soreness and then it went away but I was so fatigued at that point where it's like your whole body is drained and I noticed this with other Everest I've done you get to a point where your legs aren't feeling like the limiting factor it's your whole body and your whole fatigue. You're just, you're just completely destroyed across the board. And so, yeah, it's, it's like, not like the legs just get more tired and more tired and more sore and more sore and more sore or in more pain. It's like you get to a point where you just get stuck. And like I mentioned, my heart rate, you know, wouldn't rise above 140 beats per minute. I think you get to a point where you're just kind of stuck riding one gear. It's like you can't go faster and you can't go slower because the gradient, you just, you get stuck. Um, and I think that's the good thing to know. It's like even this effort, there's not one point that feels harder than, let's just say, an FTP test, uh, even though it's a short duration. It's just that you get stuck at this uncomfortable point for so long that mentally it starts to wear on you. I think that's that's what compounds more is like not the physical pain. It's just the mental pain. And also when you have X amount left, like I got to a point at 50 K and I was like, I have 8,000 feet left. Like this is going to be more a couple hours of more of feeling this way. And when you take that in, that's when it feels hard. I was the taint <laughs> surprisingly well, no chamois cream, never changed the chamois. I think I 
mention in the doc at the end of it that uh, honestly just my nuts like swelled up for multiple days afterward um yeah kind of it's funny i didn't get like bruising like a vasectomy uh but the swelling was comparable which is kind of crazy and just like sore uh also like your uh what's it called like there there was some like a name for it it's like i don't know sweat bumps uh, jj do you know what i'm talking about like have you how do i say this is gonna sound so disgusting when i pulled the chamois off at the end of the day the redness and the the zit like looking stuff going on was out of control everywhere i don't even know i don't know what i don't know what was going on but it kind of freaked me out and i will say i was so chafed uh, at a couple points that it was like swollen so like like my sit bones didn't have uh saddle sores but they were literally like had like chafe spots and swelling and i guess only riders will know the difference between this so that was really interesting and a lot of that went away quick uh it was like as soon as i got cleaned up just lotion everything up within a day or two is pretty much back to normal within the with it with the exception of the nuts swelling up um everything else is pretty good <laughs> did you read or listen to anything mentally slash philosophically motivating throughout your prep yeah i mean i do constantly that's just like a daily habit of mine i feel like i need that to grow the business the way i want to stay focused so do a ton of inspiration um that's why even on my top tube i had the quote be hard when it gets hard uh and that's from chad wright who is just a gnarly endurance guy i look up to and uh you know, that was something I had to remember because I'm like, it's going to get hard and you have to, that's when you need to be hard. <laughs> you know, um, there's a ton of entrepreneurs that inspire me and have the motivation. But I think one person um, that really inspired me for this was Nick Bear. Uh, he's recently done some big endurance efforts and it's basically, he has this constant message of pursuing growth. And that's what dialed health is all about was start moving forward too. you know start moving forward is your decision every day to chase growth no matter how uncomfortable that is and seeking the discomfort inevitably and like putting yourself in this position voluntarily it will inevitably inevitably lead to growth there's like no other outcome um, unless you're just going to be bitter about it so i was like okay i'm gonna put myself in this position and i'm gonna grow from it like it has to happen and i think it's required of a lot of people because you know, fortunately for a lot of us, our lives aren't that uncomfortable on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we have to seek discomfort, I like true real discomfort to, to find that growth because it's easy to just get in this little comfort bubble and uh, comfort is a slow death. That's another fair performance quote for you. No thanks. Which faster would you have been with a Metallica playlist? <laughs> would it have been with the Metallica playlist? It would, I, honestly, so during the ride, I listened, I put headphones in for a couple laps. I didn't like it. I never ride with headphones. And so I started just playing music from my phone in my pocket, uh, which is also why we got stupid copyright on that video. But uh, anyways, we, <laughs> I had like some mellow playlists, like mellow hip hop, kind of pop music. Uh, I had some like worship music. I had some mellow stuff because my my thought going into it was that because I'll be out there for so long, I'm not gonna want this like intense music. Uh, and I totally regret not having it. Like if I had Metallica playlist, I probably would have gone 20 minutes faster. I'm just gonna throw it out there. If I had some crazy hip hop, if I would have had something way more aggressive that I could have turned on on those laps where I just was absolutely on my limit, it would have helped because when I had friends come out, they were playing Metallica on a speaker and as soon as I heard it, it fired me up. So. If I had Metallica playlist, probably 20 minutes faster. I'm just going to say that. What saddle? Has that always been your go-to saddle? Uh, yeah, it has been for a while. And I measured my sit bones and found out that a 143 mil width is like a good fit for me. And this comes spec'd on a lot of specialized bikes. I don't know if it's like the most common size or not. I have friends who run wider saddles. But a specialized power saddle, uh, there's a couple variations of it. Um but a 143 width is a good fit for me. And I run a, a variation of that across all my bikes. For a part of the 27 hours where the downhill felt like the most satisfying, like one vivid memory of a certain downhill or run. Um, that's a good question. I know that the downhill got easier and easier. And it was interesting because I thought when night came, because there was no street lights, the downhill would be super difficult. Uh, but it wasn't as hard as I thought. And I think it's because I had so many laps leading up to it. I knew my breaking points. I knew the terrain so well that 
even on the descent, I, I, I guess I will say this one thing stands out where it wasn't a whole descent, but I realized that for the big hairpin toward the bottom, there was a piece of tar on the ground. And because there was no street lights, I had to wait until, you know, I would see one sign that would kind of light up uh, on the hairpin. And then I knew my breaking point was when it was on the left side of the road, when I would see the tar go through my headlight. And I remember thinking like, wow, that's such a specific thing. Like I'm literally, it's 1 a.m. I'm, I just, I'm doing 45 miles an hour. And as soon as I see this piece of tar come through my headlight, that's when I start hitting the brakes hard so I can make the hairpin. And I did that lap after lap after lap. And I think that was one thing where I was like, whoa, like I'm really focused right now, which is pretty cool. Um, and so that was kind of the descent. I did see a deer on one and had to come to a stop because it was literally stuck in the headlights. Uh, but other than that, I think one moment I had on the ride that was really vivid and cool was when my headlight went out. Uh, and we didn't really talk about this much in the dock. Uh, you kind of see a car following me up. It was crazy timing. So I literally, my, my headlight starts going out on the descent and I wasn't checking my battery, which was really stupid. And I started climbing and literally a third of the way up, it just goes out completely. And there's no street lights and I'm looking around and I'm just like, dude, it is so dark. Let me, I'll give you an example. It is so dark that even with my headlight on, I can't see my bottle and my bottle cage. That's how pitch black it was. So when I would put my bottle in my cage, I'd have to like search for it sometimes because I couldn't see it. <laughs> and so when my headlight went out completely, I almost couldn't even see my bars. But once my eyes adjusted to it, some of the visibility came back and I started looking around and I'm just basically on this cliff side with the ocean and I have all the stars and I stopped freaking out at that point and I was like, this is really cool. Like, I got to take this in. Like, I, I'm just riding in the middle of the night on one of the coolest roads I've ever been on. So I did soak that in at the time. And thankfully, like five minutes later, uh, Josh, who came and did some laps with us, left. And uh, no, so it wasn't that late. Maybe it was like 9 or 10 p.m. He was leaving. And so uh, he came back up or he saw me and I said, hey, my headlight's gone. So he followed me back up with his car headlights. So I made it to the top and it was good. So, yeah, it wasn't as late, but that was a really cool, cool moment. What was the training for this ride like? Was it tough being away from the kids? Yeah. So I kind of brought up the fact that I didn't train much more than I normally do. And a lot of it has to do with the fact I have three kids uh, under four years old now and, or under three and a half, whatever you want to say. And it's just, it's a, it's a super demanding home life. Like it's awesome, it's incredibly fulfilling, but it's exhausting and it's a lot of work and you are, there's someone always on the hook. So when I'm out training, it means my wife is like with the kids. And so there's this level of dad guilt that you do get that's very real uh, just by leaving home. Uh, and I think it's a misconception or people like assume that you're going to get so motivated to go work and do all this stuff when you have kids. But in my opinion, like it's the opposite. Like you want to be home more with your kids. You don't want to be away uh, because there's that level of guilt. So yeah, that's why I didn't even try and take on some insane training plan because I knew it wouldn't, it would just be negative for the rest of the family. Um, Cause everything you do affects them and whoever's watching your kids mainly you're going to be your spouse <laughs> so for me it's my wife and i i yeah anyways um it was so yeah it was tough it was tough to be away from them even on the weekend i went down there there was kind of times i'm looking around and i'm like man why like why am i doing this and in my head i was like i need to make this worth it and i think it was part of the internal fuel of just keeping me going and accomplishing the goal. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to go through all this and be away from my family and spend all this money on this event that could be, you know, all these resources I have could be going to my family and I'm putting them into this. So I'm going to make it count. Uh, so that was part of the motivation for sure. How did you determine what power slash effort to hold for the whole ride? Was it a percentage of FTP? Uh, kind of, I, I was wanting to try and stay in zone two as much as I can. And like high zone two for me would be around like 250, uh, Watts and I dual sided power pedals. Thank you, Garmin for those. Those were incredible. Um, and so I did my best to keep it around 250, but some of the, the grades were like 19%. And even with my gearing, I had a, a one by 36 up front and I had a 44 big ring on the back. So I had like this gravel gearing setup. Even with that, it was hard to go in a straight line and hold 250. So I did start paper boying at one point. 
Um, but I think to be honest, I, I paid attention to that early in the day. And at the end of the day, it didn't even matter. Like I just literally had to get up the climb and I was looking at heart rate more than power to be honest at that point, uh, because I was just sort of fascinated with the fact I couldn't get my heart rate up, uh, that high. And so, yeah, at, at the end of the day, I just, you know, I was paper boying, going like three and a half miles an hour up this thing and just clawing my way to get up. And I did not worry about the wattage, but with the watts, but my, my normalized power was, I think still 214 at the end of the 27 hours. And I think my average was like 200. So the fact it stayed over that was pretty insane, actually, for me. Did you have a set number of calories per hour that you targeted on the bike? No. And I was very clear about this on the podcast where I said, I think it's a waste of time to plan out all of your food past a 12 hour effort because you you cannot predict what your body is going to want. Like the best thing I ate on this whole ride uh, was those meals I didn't even bring. And so I have gone into, like I did the Everest on the first of the year. I tracked every single calorie I brought and I brought 7,000 calories with me. A huge variety of food, tracked everything, all Ziploc bag, everything was out. And I ended up eating about half of it. And the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches I brought were the thing that hit the spot that day. And I just wanted more and more and more of those. So I went, I had a friend go and get me more. And so that was to me a, a real uh, like lesson learned where it's like a waste of time to plan and you just have to eat as much as you can from the start the entire time. Um, and I knew that liquid calories would be a big way to do it. So yeah, I, I just knew huge variety of foods uh, and eat as much as your gut can handle. And I really did that. You know, as soon as I felt like I could take in more, I would, uh, even if it was just slamming an extra gel on a, on a climb. <laughs> this is probably a good one to end on. Another vasectomy or double Everest again? <laughs> I'd actually have to think about that. <laughs> if if the vasectomy didn't have such long-term consequences, actually, to be honest, the recovery from the double Everest wasn't that much easier than the, the vasectomy recovery. Um, dude, I'd really have to think about that. <laughs> I don't even know. Um, okay, if I really have to choose on the spot, I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably go the double Everest because at least if you get some content out of it, because you know you're not getting content out of my vasectomy. Not, I guess I did a podcast on it. <laughs> no more vasectomies, man. <laughs> so that's it. Hopefully that gives you some more insight into how the heck we pulled this ride off. And huge thank you to everyone who sent the questions in. I really appreciate it. And hopefully I got to yours and you're satisfied with the answer. If you do have a question I didn't get to, drop it in the comments below. I'll make sure I respond to you there. And also let me know what you guys think I should do a Q&A on next uh, because there's probably not going to be an insane ride like this in the future. If there's something specific you want me to talk about, drop it in the comments and I'll make sure I get to it. Also, make sure you're subscribed. Hit the bell notification to get reminded when I put out new videos. We're doing one a week now, you guys, and we're staying on top of it, which I'm really hyped about. So uh, thanks for all the support. Um, I think I need to ask you to thumbs up it as well. We just got to get this algorithm moving. So uh, anyways, thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. Yeah, dude, growing up, literally, I'd eat like Reese's Puffs every morning. Yeah, I was just like that kid who had all that, which I thought was awesome at the time.